The Tom Woods Show, episode 1668. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Folks, by now you've probably noticed that news about the virus is almost always fact-free hysteria these days. So you need my brand new free ebook, Your Facebook Friends Are Wrong About the Lockdown. Go pick it up at wrongaboutlockdown.com. Hey everybody, Tom Woods here, joined today by Chris Borer, who is the author of the brand new book, The Ethics of Anarcho-Capitalism. I'm linking to the book as usual at tomwoods.com slash 1668. For those of you who are new, and there are some of you, anarcho-capitalism, of course, is a system in which the market economy is extended throughout society such that all activities that involve the exchange of money are brought into the private sector, that is to say, into the voluntary part of the economy. There's no coercion involved in extracting money from people for services. People voluntarily pay for various services. So, in other words, we're taking the non-aggression principle to its logical conclusion, and that is a system of complete statelessness, and that is what we're going to be talking about today, at least some of the basic ideas associated with it. Chris, welcome to the show. Thanks, Tom. Good to be with you. Just introduced your book. Um, first question that would come to mind is why another ANCAP book? That's a great question. Uh, there are so many good ones, especially for us who love libertarianism. I think the main motivation was, you know, when I think about the way that people think about property rights and the way we communicate libertarianism to people who are interested but don't fully understand it, sometimes there's a disconnect between the core theory that we're using and you know, newbies and how they understand what we're talking about. So I wanted to make a book that was approachable and kind of laid out libertarianism in a simple way. And I also wanted to try a different format. Uh, there are a lot of great academic works that you could look at, you know, Rothbard, Hoppe. And there are a lot of great kind of um, easy to consume media, tons of podcasts and comic books and cool things like that. But I thought there was room for another uh, narrative nonfiction book that, you know, talks about the theory, but does it with a little bit of story. So it's easily digestible. Okay. Well, that is as good a reason as any. And I can attest that the format of this book is rather unique and I like it very much. It was not the book I was expecting it to be when I saw the title. I thought it was going to be uh, some kind of systematic treatise introduced step by step, which is nothing wrong with that. But I thought to myself, oh my gosh, how many treatises do we need? <laughs> and yet I was pleasantly surprised because what you've got here are uh, brief treatments of a lot of the major concepts that people need to understand, not just to be able to defend what we're all about, but really to understand it on any reasonable level. And then, of course, I was uh, pleasantly surprised to note the rather handsome gentleman who appears on page 60 of this book. Yes, that's true, ladies and gentlemen, there is a portrait of the old man here in this book. All the more reason to go out and get your copy. Of course, as always, I link to the guest book on the show notes page. That's tomwoods.com slash 1668. So I'm going to pick out a few topics that you uh, cover here, and then I want to get into something... Um, maybe more fundamental here. So, but let's start with some specifics. Uh, first is cooperation. Because I would say, if I had to summarize the way Ludwig von Mises looked at society and you know, what the liberal, in the classical liberal sense, program was all about, it would be property. In fact, there's a quotation in which he said, if I had to summarize my program, it would be private property and the means of production and everything that follows from that. But when people hear property, they think, oftentimes they think selfishness, they think dog eat dog, they think the same thing when they hear capitalism and the market economy. But you have in here a chapter on cooperation, which is something I have tried to convey to people <laughs> over the years, that, that uh, to the contrary, what we're talking about is not any of those things, but in a really fundamental way, cooperation. So talk to us about that. Yeah, it's really a key insight that many libertarians miss when they're first joining the movement. You know, they get excited about economics and property and capital accumulation. But at the end of the day, what we're really talking about is just people getting along and living together and working together. When you think about an ethical system like libertarianism, what it's trying to accomplish is to develop rules to avoid conflict so that people can live harmoniously and cooperate all the time. So I think it's a fundamental thing that new people to the movement need to understand what is our guiding star, cooperation. 
what are we trying to accomplish? And how do the benefits like property and nice homes and cars come from that cooperation? And when we see all the different firms in the economy, and they're all producing different things, people think of it as they're competing in a doggy dog world of uh, one person wins and another person loses. But what should they be thinking about when they see the economy? There is competition in the economy. So why should they be looking at, at that fundamentally as an arena of cooperation then? Yeah. And I like the I like the term arena because an example I like to give is sporting events. You, know, you have two soccer teams and they're both fighting, right? Trying to win the game. But what they're really doing is sort of an elegant expression of cooperation. Everybody plays by the rules because they all have the same goal, right? They all want to play the game to see who wins. So even though to someone in the stands, it might seem like an old fashioned battle in a war, it's really an elegant display of cooperation. And that's the same thing that happens in the market when there are different stores competing for business or different firms working together or maybe working against each other. As long as they all play by the rules and stay within ethical boundaries, it remains cooperation. Well, not to mention that we have a world full of resources and we have an amount of technical knowledge that couldn't be contained in one brain. We have just so much, so many talents scattered around the world that even though there isn't one person ordering everybody around, in fact, if there were one person ordering everybody around as to what role to play in that economy, that would be the opposite of cooperation. So what we instead have is people who fit themselves into where they can serve other people best, and they do that voluntarily, and the result is, uh, you know, is the abundance we see around us. So it's it's focusing entirely on competition, I think, misses the boat. But fundamentally, property, as as I said, with that Mises quotation, property is what we're all about, and property frankly, is not that attractive sounding a slogan, especially in our day and age when property is thought of as being uh, an arena of privilege and exclusion and, you know, all kinds, all the sins we associate, we're supposed to associate with capitalism are concentrated in property. So how can you rehabilitate property in a way that won't offend, you know, everybody living today, unfortunately? Yeah, and it's it's really about changing that per, that world perspective, right? Property is the means by which we're able to cooperate. It's a simple system of rules that, you know, if we understand who owns what and who's in charge of different things, then people are able to get along. If whether they're neighbors and they want to make sure that you know you keep, you stay on your side of the fence, I stand mine, and everyone can be happy. Or if we're engaged in a very complex business deal, you know, everyone needs to understand who's bringing what resources to some initiative. And that's what really allows capitalism to produce such exorbitant capital and amazing technology, resources, and other things that we really enjoy about modern society. Well, and of course, if, if we focus again on Mises, who is one of my favorites, there's something about property that allows entrepreneurs to do what it is that they do. And this, is, this gets to the heart of the socialist calculation problem. And, and that has to do, on a fundamental level, with property. Are you able to talk about that? Oh, definitely. One thing I really like about ethics is that, you know, if you can understand the the fundamental rules by which society operates and you can set them up correctly, then that can, you know, naturally, of course, uh, translate into human progress. So Mises understood that when you have a system that respects property and people behave ethically, then humans naturally tend to cooperate, produce capital, and then over time, we generate the kind of society that we want to live in with high standards of living where people are able to pursue the kind of things that they want to pursue because they don't have to worry about food and clothing and the basics. So Mises was definitely right. And from an economist perspective, it makes total sense to start from property. But if you're interested in libertarian ethics, you step back a little bit and say, you know, cooperation and the uh, the day-to-day interactions between people are the more fundamental thing that we're trying to achieve. And property is just a tool that we use in order to make sure people can get along. In your table of contents, there is that A word, anarchy, staring you in the face. Now, that is a scary word for almost everyone. And almost everyone, and I mean really, practically everyone, hearing that word, will think we believe the opposite of what we think. So how do you detoxify that word, make it not frightening to people, and dare I say, make it even appealing? That's a great question. And I try to make it clear that 
you know, throughout the book, what we're trying to do is just make it so that people can get along and live their lives how they want to live. That's all libertarians really want. And so before I introduced the idea of anarchy, I introduced the idea of the state and what is the government doing. And just like Rothbard's little pamphlet, uh, The Anatomy of the State, you really can just lay out that the state is doing all the, it's doing fundamentally the same things that regular criminals who are not cooperating in society are doing. So uh, when you think about the state as kind of a bad actor ethically, anarchy is a pretty simple concept where you're just removing the largest bad actor in society. And then you can just continue with a peaceful free market. So if you build up to it slowly, I think it's a little more palatable. But certainly when if people flip straight to that chapter, they could get scared away. Well, uh, no doubt. And of course, with a word like that, people are inclined to skip ahead to that chapter. But <laughs> that's uh, them's the breaks. That's, that's the way people are. All right. So I want to step back for a minute and ask you about your background, because generally, I'm sorry this, that the movement is so small. Somebody writes a book on anarcho-capitalism, I generally know who it is. And I have not encountered you before. So that's a good thing in some ways. I don't want the movement to be so small that I know everybody. But um, it makes me curious. Well, what's your background? Uh, so I guess my background is mainly in uh, engineering. So uh, I did a lot of robotics work, artificial intelligence, and software engineering as my day-to-day -day job. Um, as far as libertarianism, I was kind of I don't know, woken up by the Ron Paul 2008 campaign, like so many of us in the movement. And uh, ever since then, I've been you know, voraciously reading and ingesting all the great libertarian stuff that's been coming from, you know, since then. Um, do you have a blog? I mean, do you have a presence online? I have a little blog, uh, chrisborer.com, where I just talk a little bit about um, maybe some of my technical work and the book, obviously. And just before you go on, how long did this book take you to put together? Uh, it was about four years. But I was doing it part time, you know, sort of my passion project when I would get home from work. Yeah, you know, I imagine real authors like yourself or Michael Malice can <laughs> bang out a book very quickly. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. Because well, of course, it's it's it, what we do full time. But <laughs> if it were a spare time project, it would it would certainly take a lot longer. Who did the illustrations for you? Uh, I found an illustrator online. He was actually uh, Milos. He's a guy from Eastern Europe who does amazing portraits. I thought the book would be more fun if you could kind of see the people who were being quoted rather than just. Uh, you know, seeing the name, um, you know, putting a face to a name, I think really, <laughs> for me, it was kind of fun just to see all the different people that have contributed a lot to the movement. So I really want Yeah, to for some reason, yeah, as I flipped through it, for some reason, I felt happier seeing the faces. I don't know, because I know half these people, you know, and seeing Walter Block's face there makes me happy. <laughs> so I was glad you decided to do that. All right, so you got a chapter in here on praxeology. Now that, again, this is a this, first of all, that sounds more complicated than it is. You hear the word praxeology. It's, it's a word that's not in most dictionaries. You have to go to, for people who still in the age of the internet use dictionaries, you have to go to one of those gigantic dictionaries that when they say they have all the words, they, <laughs> they really mean it. Right. But most people have no idea what, what praxeology is, and they hear the word, they think, I'll never understand this. Uh, but what's it all about, and what's, what's the role of it? Yeah, praxeology is just a tool for thinking about how people behave in an abstract way. Um, so Austrian economists use praxeology to create sort of abstract laws about human interaction. And from that, they can build you know, the corpus of Austrian economics. And libertarian ethicists can do the same thing with uh, ethical rules. So if you wanted to, for example, you know, define the term conflict, you know, so everyone really understood what you were talking about in an abstract way, you could use praxeology to say what conflict is at a high level without getting into the nitty gritty of specifics like, you know, attacking someone, murder, theft, things like that. So it's kind of like the algebra of social science where you can have uh, variables instead of using hard, you know, concrete numbers. Well, let me um, describe praxeology as I've used it. And then I want to hear what your thoughts are on its role in certainly in your project. In, in one of my books, The Church and the Market, I start off explaining how praxeology really works because what people hear is uh, praxeology is the study of human action. Economics, according to Mises, is its up to now most elaborated part. And it's a, it's a way of taking the fact of, of uh, human action and figuring out what the implications of that are. So the human beings act, well, then – from that, certain things follow, and you, you wind up getting into value scales and that, you know, p 
people choose what they value more over what they value less, which implies that the very act of choice involves the setting aside of some things while preferring other things. So there's a ve- process of valuation that's going on. And what I do in, in the first chapter of that book is walk people from the fact of human action all the way through supply and demand curves and the law of diminishing marginal utility. And I get there simply by step-by-step deducing from the fact of human action. And for the most part, I'm able to just do that entirely deductively and reach these conclusions. So the same way I would do that in geometry. I have some things that I know, and then I pull out of that additional things that I now know, having thought about it uh, more clearly. So it's a non-empirical approach to the social sciences. My sense is that you have a more ambitious uh, place in your mind for what praxeology is and what it can do uh, for our intellectual system. So how would you address that? It's very similar, actually. That's really the wonderful thing about praxeology. It's as you were describing what you were doing and how you were laying out the fundamentals of economics, you were referring to things and people, but you weren't diving into the details, the specifics. So you were able to talk at a high level and really capture the essence of economic thinking. So you know, praxeology does not have to just be the deductive part. It's really the abstraction of what people are doing. So talking about, instead of talking about somebody crossing the street, you're just talking about you know, means and ends of what people want to do in general, and then it applies more generally. So for ethics, you're not trying to uh, use praxeology to motivate libertarianism. You're not saying, you know, because of praxeology, you must be a libertarian. You're just saying, if you want to define libertarianism and talk about uh, how people should interact, you want to do it in a general abstract way that applies to all human interaction. And so praxeology is a perfect fit because it allows you to make definitions that apply in general instead of to specific use cases. What makes praxeology preferable to any other approach then? Um, That's a great question. (laughs) So I think if uh, you were to take like a physics-based approach to defining ethics, which is pretty common these days, you can run into trouble. So lots of people like to define libertarianism based on physical boundaries or border crossings or violence. And if you use any of these terms from physics or physical reality, you're really missing out on the core thrust of ethics, which is trying to avoid conflict in general and trying to promote cooperation. And really the best way to describe a system of rules for promoting cooperation is using praxeology and more abstract concepts that don't worry so much about the underlying physical reality of what's going on, but more about what are people trying to do in general? What are their means? What are their ends? And then you can start with an abstract idea of conflict, aggression, the non-aggression principle. And from there, you you use your abstract ethical rules, just like Austrian economists used abstract uh, economic laws to then apply them to the real world. By the way, I love the, the, the simplicity of your preface that you were, you say, when I was 22 years old, I read that an individual's personality tends to solidify around age 25. Seeing this brief window of opportunity inspired me to be proactive about shaping my view of life. I wanted to decide what ethical and moral systems I would live by, so I spent my free time researching what was out there, and I was shocked by what I found. Shocked to find a simple, beautiful, and powerful ethical system. Jeez, if only there were more people in the world who thought to themselves, before I get too much older, I better really, <laughs> really think clearly about my worldview by examining the alternatives. Yeah. It was so a, thank you for doing that. <laughs> it was a pretty wild journey. And I'm, I feel really lucky that um, there were so many excellent libertarians and ANCAPs who had been predecessors and generated the media that I consumed to become an ANCAP. Because if that hadn't happened, it's you know highly possible I could have just been a regular old Republican or a regular old Democrat thinking I'd found like the promised land, right? When there was actually yeah. this, this even better place that I would have never known about. By the way, that's how I feel about myself. I feel sure I would have been much, much more conventional if I hadn't had this great literature and these great people to teach me otherwise. All right, so when you get into anarcho-capitalism, you get into certain ideas. Not everybody accepts every one of them, but they accept enough of them to be ANCAP. So among them would be the non-aggression principle, which you cover, possibly the idea of self-ownership, property and where the rights of property come from, uh, exchange, you know, the the mutual benefit of voluntary exchange. I mean, there's a there are a lot of basic things that we take for granted 
because we just we understand the fundamentals of the system. But then, you know, you may have all these fundamentals, but then people will come up with wild scenarios about what would you do in this crazy situation armed only with your ANCAP principles. <laughs> so you have uh, a chapter in here on lifeboat scenarios. Now, describe for us what those are and whether whether what you're describing is a challenge to the beliefs you hold. Yeah, uh, I love lifeboat scenarios. It's kind of been this this nagging thing that's been uh, haunting libertarianism you know, since the days of old where you come up with a set of principles, you say property is great, the non-aggression principle is great, and you'd explain it to somebody who's kind of skeptical. And then they would dream up some wild scenario where they think that your system falls apart. So um, I think one classic one that Murray Rothbard used to use was if you, you know, fall off a building and you grab onto somebody's private flagpole, which is hanging off the side of the building, do they have to let you into the do they have to let you into the building or do you have to let go of the flagpole because it's their private property? So you just kind of come up with a, a crazy scenario that really tests the boundaries of the ethical theory that you're advocating. And I think it can be very annoying if your theory is not good. You know, I think it's very easy to poke holes in socialism or communism, but libertarianism generally holds it very well. So the, the lifeboat scenarios have to get stranger and stranger in order to to find something to bite onto. But one nice thing about the praxeological approach to libertarianism is it reduces the number of lifeboat scenarios that people could possibly use to attack libertarianism. So it makes it... Okay, how so? How so? So I alluded to this a little bit earlier. You know, the physics approach, uh, physics-based approach, where you use ideas like self-ownership or uh, original appropriation to define property and libertarianism. Uh, you could come up with, say, like... Um, let me come up with a lifeboat scenario for you right now. So if you're out in the wilderness, you know, Tom Woods is out in the wilderness and he sees an apple, he can just pick it and then that's his property and that's original appropriation. And then if you and I are out in the wilderness together and we both see another apple and we both want it, you know, we could have a foot race and the first person to grab it is the original appropriator and they own it. Unfortunately, <laughs> if we're having another foot race, we see a third apple and, you know, you're, you're getting a little ahead of me because you're a little faster. And right before you grab the apple, I trip you, and then I grab the apple. Now, original appropriation, I'm the original appropriator, I, I grab the apple first. But I kind of did something unlibertarian to do that. So a libertarian would say, hmm, I don't think that you, Chris is actually the guy who should own the apple in this case. So we've kind of come up with a weird lifeboat scenario that pokes a hole in the idea of original appropriation. So now if you look at the praxeology, you can come up with a more abstract set of rules than original appropriation, self-ownership, and exchange that then won't suffer from that particular scenario. And I can talk more about that if you're interested. But it can get Yeah, please deep. do. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, because yeah, I'd like to see that worked out. So when you're thinking about libertarianism in terms of praxeology, you're really interested in conflict and aggression and the non-aggression principle. So conflict in an, in an abstract praxeological sense is just when two or more people try to do things that can't both happen, right? We both want to eat the apple. We both want to sit in the same spot. So if we both try to do something like that, a mutually exclusive action, you know, set of actions, then there's going to be a conflict. And using praxeology, you can say that aggression is any action that causes conflict. So when you think about, and the non-aggression principle obviously says, well, don't do aggression, right? So don't cause conflict. So in our Apple scenario, you would look at it and you'd say, well, in this situation, who caused the conflict? If you, were, if you told me, give me that Apple, I should be the owner, you know, the original appropriation might say, no, Chris should have it. But a praxeological approach that's looking at conflict and aggression would say, actually, the person who started this conflict is Chris because he tripped you first when you were both trying to get the Apple. Tell me, what do you think is a weakness in our system, given how much you've studied it? Is there anything where you say... Eh, if I were really pressed on this, I would have trouble, or we need more work done on such and such. Oh, there, there are tons of areas like that. <laughs> so, All right, what's the worst one, or a couple of the worst? I'd say I had the hardest time with children's rights and animal rights. Yeah. I did a lot of research trying to, come to find the best arguments for animal rights. So I read a, a number of books on that to make sure I was sure up on what I was doing. So I think that's a very ripe area for research, and if people want to write papers on that, it'd be really helpful. Yeah, I've been thinking the same thing. I had Bob Murphy on for a, an episode where we talked about areas that needed work 
And those those always come up. So there's been some, but not nearly enough. And on animals, I think what we have is pretty thin <laughs> and not really very convincing, to be honest with you. Yeah, uh, not I, Certainly not that would satisfy people who want really good answers, you know, who are very interested in that topic. I'm not sure. I totally agree. And I think this is an important point that libertarians, libertarians in general should be more aware of. And we, we need to distinguish the libertarian ethical system from the various moral systems that people have. Because, you know, the moral systems can vary and people can have different ideas of what's good to do with your life, you know, what kind of person you want to be. But I think we all libertarians agree on the fundamental ethics of, you know, cooperation and conflict. So if we can separate those two things, it'll be a much easier conversation to say, well, how should we treat animals from an ethical perspective? And how should we treat animals from a moral perspective? And once we make that distinction, I think people who care a lot about animals will see, you know, I can adopt libertarianism and I can still have this additional moral system that makes me think I sh we should take care of animals and be nice to them. Yeah, right. I mean, uh, the answers that I've heard, as you say, is really a matter of, um, it's, it's not really a libertarian answer. It's not like, well, libertarianism compels us to have this particular view. It's more that, well, animals don't have rights. They, they surely can't have rights in the sense that human beings have rights. But it, it seems like such a stark all or nothing. So they don't have rights. And therefore, somebody could just, what, torture them? Just, uh, and, and then you'd say, yeah, but maybe in a covenant community, people would agree that they wouldn't torture animals. I, mean, I don't know. It's just, it's not that convincing. So I, I definitely would like to see uh, more work done. But yeah, definitely. but for, but given what you've accomplished here, I think this is a nice overview. Like it's a, it's approachable. It's not dense, but yet it's not frivolous either. There's, there's rigor here, but not so much that it intimidates the reader. And so I think it, it can play a role in, you know, helping people just getting started to fill out their understanding of it efficiently and effectively with good information. So I highly recommend it. Uh, the book is The Ethics of Anarcho-Capitalism by our guest, Chris Borer. Chris, thanks so much for your time. Book will be linked at tomwoods.com slash 1668. I appreciate uh, your effort here and your time with us today. Thanks, Tom. Great to be with you. All right, folks, let me tell you what's going on here. Later this week, much later this week, but later this week all the same, yet another Woods ebook is coming out. Quite topical. I'll just put it that way. It'll be quite topical. The episodes this week will be, I'm going to try to make them non-virus, non-police, non-rioting. So we've done a lot on that, and there are other things in life to talk about, so I'm going to really try my best. Now, tomorrow I can't make any guarantees, but the rest of the week should be fairly non-virus, non-police, just to give us a breather. But that ebook, you know, if you're thinking to yourself, Woods' episodes aren't quite as topical this week. They're great, but they're not quite as topical. Hold your horses for the ebook is all I'll say. Maybe with your detective powers, you can figure out what I'm driving at here with that ebook. But anyway, as you know what that reminds me of? I got to go buy a domain name for that ebook. So <laughs> let me go do that and I'll see you all tomorrow. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time. Like the sound of The Tom Woods Show? My audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at Podsworth.com.